I want to welcome you back to another episode of Laid Back History. Um, this is our second part of our three-part series of the road trip that Rich, Brian, and I took during um, on Memorial Day where we drove around the sea uh, to visit some of the burial sites of early frontier patriots, uh, men that had fought in the American Revolution and on the frontier. So last week we visited Van Kirk Cemetery uh, in the uh, burial site of William Curry. Uh, and at that time I had mentioned you know, all the work that looked like that was going on in the cemetery and, and we thanked whoever was doing it. Well, since the video aired, I got a lot of comments uh, where people saying that it was the Day family and, and you know, the, the Amwell Township Historical Society. Uh, and so I just wanna thank them. You know, it's fabulous work that you're doing there on a volunteer basis. Uh, and I just love to see that people that care about history and are taking care of it and helping to preserve it. So, so thank you so much for that. Now today, uh, we're going to be uh, visiting the the, uh, the the burial site, the grave site of Lou Wetzel. Uh, Lou Wetzel is probably one of the most uh, well-known and mythical figures of the early Pennsylvania frontier. And so um, it's a, a fascinating story uh, with him. Uh, and so uh, Rich is going to be telling that portion of it as we head towards uh, West Virginia and the, the grave site of Lou Wetzel. All right, so we are coming down 88. We're about eh, 15, 20 minutes out from uh, uh, where uh, Lou Wetzel is uh, is buried. So, Rich, why don't you tell us a little bit about Lewis? <laughs> Wetzel was one of the predominant frontier figures back then. Um, very renowned Indian fighter. And probably the finest combatant that ever was. Um, at a young age, of course, his he was the son of, uh, was it Mary Bonnet? Who? Bonnet? Bonnet Bonnet, I'm not sure. They were, they were Huguenots. Yeah. Um, and John Wetzel. And from a very early age, <coughs> uh, Lou was taught you know, the ways of the forest, hunting, survival, um, you know, and everything. He, he was he was very much the, the quintessential frontiersman. Um, James Fenimore Cooper actually modeled part of Natty Bumpo, Hawkeye, uh, on The Last of the Mohicans after Lou Wetzel. Wow. <laughs> and, um, but L Lewis Wetzel is one of those guys where Back then, he was considered a hero. Today, a lot of people consider him a psychopath. Um, he took a lot of scalps. Uh, numbers range anywhere from 30 to 200. And again, somewhere in there, the truth lies, but it, it's hard to say, you know, after 200 years of myth and as the legend grew, so to speak. I think it's hard, wouldn't you say, Rich, for us to look back and judge somebody at that time with, through our eyes today, because things are so much different. It is, you it know? is very, very much so. We you know? can't put our morals and morality on what they were doing because it was a completely different time. Yeah, back, I mean, back then, you know, you had the, the frontier settlers coming into this area, especially after the uh, Treaty of Fort Stanwix in 68, 1768. Um, so they moved into this area and um, it was partially because the natives, Indians, however you want to term it, from the East after, you know, the Revolutionary War um, wanted to get back at their enemies and they signed a treaty with the British English giving settlers this area okay. so basically what you have then Rich is you have the settlers coming out here now they have a treaty thinking this is their land mm -hmm. the natives that are out here feel like it's their land so when they're fighting over it I mean they each think they're in the right yeah. you know, so it's 
it's hard for us to look back and I mean we look at and call them atrocities at that time they were just defending what was there yeah but you, you, you got to remember too that the, the Treaty of Fort Stanwix you know it basically said that everything west of the Ohio River was Indian territory mm -hmm. but here's what the problem was I'm not gonna say I'm you know you got everyone come out here and settle but what do they do they go oh my god look across that river yeah <laughs> it is so nice over there yep so let's go hunt over there uh, you know, and the so what happens? The grass is always yeah. greener on the other side so, of the fence. So, you know, and then what happens too? You know, the Indians are like, well, I mean, you got to understand too, raiding, that is something that they did. Right. That is part of their culture. Right. So, was it so out of, you know, it, it wouldn't have been out of, you know, uh, the realm that they're going, well, we got all these people that are right across the river and we can use all the streams as highways. So, they'd go one stream. Go right up over the hill, down the other side, attack anything they could find. I mean, that's what they did, you know. Right. But again, like you said, you know, looking back through the, the prism of history, you know, you, it, it's <laughs> yeah. We when when Brian and I first got into reenacting, um, we would get every every event we did. There was always the one person that came up to us and made the mistake, made the statement that the white man taught the Indians to scalp. That is not true. The white man taught the Indians to scalp for money. Oh, yeah. um, There's a reason why they wore a top knot. Yeah, that that was that was that was a war trophy. Yeah, the, you know, yeah. That was a war trophy. So, but anyway, getting back to Wetzel. Yeah, sorry, that's okay. Um, you know, he was he was the quintessential Indian fighter. He he, yeah, he he, he, he took was a lot. Good at he what took, he did. He was very good at what he did. There were a few guys that were very well known. For one certain ability, Brian. What's that? Loading and oh, shooting loading on, on shooting run. on the run. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sam Brady could do it. Wetzel yeah. could do it. Yeah. Daniel Boone could do it. Yep. Simon Kenton could do it. Yeah, there's someone. And there. anybody that has any familiarity with, um, what do you call it? Firing, loading, and firing a flintlock rifle. It's. I want to say it's a complicated procedure, but it's a little bit involved. And it is best performed standing still. Yeah. But not at a dead run. Uh, but Wetzel and Kenton and Boone and, you know, the others could do this on a full tilt run. Load and fire the gun. And Wetzel became known as one of the men that their gun was always loaded. Didn't they say that that's he would actually carry balls in his cheek? Yeah. <laughs> where, where was he? Where did he come from? Where was he? He was originally born uh, right around Lancaster, uh, 1754, 55 ish. So he and Brady are the same age. Or roughly the same age. Um, his first encounter with Indians was in 1777 the year of the bloody sevens and they called it the year of the bloody sevens uh down here on the frontier uh, because there were just tons of indian raids into the settled areas and a lot of people died on both sides in that year um but he was 13 years old and he and his younger brother were out and Long story short, with that, because he could talk forever on Wetzel. There's been hundreds of books written about written about him, but we've got to keep it short. So, long story short, they were captured, and they were taken across the Ohio River. The Indians made camp, and Lou, being the older of the two, <coughs> um, when nightfall came, the Indians fell asleep. They figured that they were far enough away from the settlements that they really didn't have to worry. They had taken the boys' shoes. There's there's no way the boys can escape. They can't run through the woods with no shoes. Wetzel tells his younger brother, we're leaving. And they go out into the forest, away from the camp, and the younger brother says, we don't, we don't have any shoes. So Lewis snuck back into the camp and stole a couple of pair of moccasins off of the sleeping Indians. 
brought them back. And then he decided, I'm going back to get my father's rifle, shooting bag, and powder horn. Huh. And he went back into the camp again and got his father's rifle and horn and bag and came back out and him and his brother took off running. <clears throat> Wasn't too long after they left that the Indians woke up and realized they're gone. They hear the Indians starting to pursue them. It was a full moon, so you could see pretty decently through the forest and something you have to consider is again back then trees were huge so it was fairly open it's not like the forest of today where you have to run through multi-flora rows and stinging nettle and all of this stuff it was it was pretty open so they could see when the indians were getting close and they would duck behind a tree and let the indians not this one brian that's oh one. that's right that's a driveway well, that's, that's a graveyard i want the cemetery yeah um, they would see when the Indians got close and they would duck behind trees and basically let the Indians go past them. Hmm. And then they would go behind the Indians and follow the Indians. Hmm. And then when the Indians would double back, they'd do the same thing again and keep going. And they managed to escape essentially three more times after they left the campsite. Huh. Let me ask you, was this where... Wasn't one of them injured? What what was it? Wetzel was shot across the breast? Wetzel, Wetzel was yeah. When they, I'm should have, probably should have put that in there. Um, he actually got shot, and the ball took part of his sternum out, and so he wasn't in the greatest of shape while they so, were escaping either. And if it wasn't for his brother, he probably wouldn't have made it. So he was probably it's the seventies. What he's thirteen? Okay, see if he's thirteen and seventy-seven, he has to be young, younger than Sam Brady. Then. Yeah, I'm not good on math. I know, but whatever. I'm 77 okay. minus 13. Okay, is. so that's what I was thinking. So that's what I was thinking. He but was these about are 13. all approximate, I think, because they know what happened in '77. They think he was about 13. Okay, but They're, think about that. Think about yeah, that. 13 now. years old. A 13 year old kid shot in the breast and taken, and having the wherewithal mm -hmm. to go back into camp to get moccasins. Then, like, no, I'm going to go back in. I'm going to get my dad's mm -hmm. rifle and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you really think about that, yeah, that's an amazing, that's an amazing kid. Oh yeah, yeah. He was he <laughs> was mean. he was definitely one of a kind. Um, there are still some descendants of his in this area, and they brag very much about being a descendant of Lewis Wetzel. Um, his next encounter with Indians would be. Uh, a few years after that, and I can't think of the date. I want to say it was 80, 1782, but um, he was with a friend of his, and forgive me, I forget the name. His first name was Forrest. I forget his last name, but um, they were walking together back to Forrest's cabin, and Forrest's wife, newly married wife, Rose was staying at the cabin. He didn't want to leave her there that long by herself. When they got back to the cabin, um, they found the cabin burned to the ground. And him and Forrest, they picked up the trail, and Lewis determined there were four Indians that had captured her. And they followed the trail across the river and um, eventually caught up to them not long after nightfall they smelled smoke from their campfire. And Forrest immediately wanted to go in their full bore, start shooting, and Lewis told him, wait. They could see Rose. They could actually hear her sobbing. And they said, Lewis told him, if we wait until morning, just after they wake up and they're still a little bit groggy, we have a much better chance of keeping Rose alive. You know, it's interesting that you say that because that must have been a common tactic because when you look at all the accounts of what Brady did, it was the same it was the same kind of thing. Wait till after they get up, just as they're first starting to rise. Yeah. And then they fire. Yep. And then they attack. 
Yeah, I so find that interesting. So. Exactly, exactly. It's an interesting. Well, the old thing about uh, the, the Rogers Rangers list of ranging roles. Don't sleep in late. Dawn is when the French and Indians attack. Yep. So, um, so at any rate, they waited until daylight. Both of them picked a man. And when they stood up, waking up, man, this road's gotten bad. <laughs> yeah, it might have been. <laughs> might have been. <clears throat> so, at any rate, um, when the Indians woke up, Lewis and Forrest both picked a man, shot him, dropped their guns, drew their hawks and their knives, and charged into the camp. The other two got the living daylight scare out of them, took off running, left their guns. They got Rose and got out of there, and she was safe. Lewis picked up the rifles and took two scalps. And not too long after that is probably when the most, how do I want to say, impactful event happened to Lewis. His father and one of his brothers was killed by Indians. Same thing with Sam Just Brady. like Sam Brady. Uh, swore blood vengeance. Same thing. And brother, he made good on that oath. Oh, yeah. uh, he made real good on that oath. Um, like I said, that counts anywhere from 30 up to 100 or whatever, depending on who you listen to, uh, as far as scalps he took. <clears throat> so... I feel like I should lock the hubs in. The camera's not shaking at all. It's okay. Yeah. Not wow. at all. <laughs> it's not the camera, folks. It's the Jeep. Um, so, at any rate, um, his father and his brother were killed. And at that point, Lewis, again, swore up blood vengeance. And he never, because of this, never settled down. Never took a home. Never as far as anybody knows, uh, had a, how do I want to say, female companion. Um, never really stayed in the settlements. He would go out for days, weeks at a time and just stay out in the woods. His sole purpose was hunting Indians. And he's actually, it's actually documented that he was one of the first guys, you're going to love this, <laughs> One of his encounters with Indians, um, chasing them, and again, rifle always loaded. The Indians treed, he treed, which treed, folks, means getting behind a tree for cover. And he put his hat on his loading rod, stuck it out behind the tree, and the Indians shot. You know, you've seen that just about every movie that we've ever watched. And he's, he's, he, he may be the one that actually starts, first came up with that idea. <laughs> At least it's one of the ones that's documented. So, and when, when, they, when they both fired at the one, at, at his hat, he uh, leaned out, shot one of the Indians. Of course, the other one thinks now he's unloaded. He sets his gun down pulls his tomahawk out and takes off after Lewis, chasing him. And Lewis reloads on the run. Indians maybe 8, 10, 12 steps behind him. Lewis gets the gun loaded, turns around, pulls the trigger. That was the end of that Indian. And again, he walks away with two or whatever more scalps. <clears throat> so he was he was very effective and very good at what he did. So, but yeah, he was on he was on the Broadhead expedition, I believe, as a scout. That was probably the closest he ever came to military service. Um, rumor has it that he actually, in his later years, was on the Lewis and Clark expedition. I see that. Um, but really, yeah, but it's not documented. <laughs> they can find no listing of his name anywhere on the rolls. Did we lose the camera? Uh, it's, yeah. just, it's pointing straight down. Oh, cool. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. 
<clears throat> um, yeah, there's no there's no firm documentation that he was on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Okay. Um, when he went down south in his later years, um, we do know that he was in jail for a while. Oh, okay. And the rumor there was that he uh, had taken up with a Spanish lady no. who was betrothed. Hmm. Um, no proof of that at all either. Um, maybe one of the most famous stories about Lewis Wetzel is the uh, Gobbler Indian. And this was down, actually there were a couple of them, but this was down in Wheeling, and here we are. Yep. Um, there were several accounts of men hearing a turkey gobble. Mm. And they would go out to hunt the turkey because, of course, they wanted to eat. Mm -hmm. And they weren't coming back. Mm. And Wetzel figured it out, and this is over by Wetzel's Cave, which is near the old B&O railway tunnel just on the other side of the Wheeling Tunnels going um, east towards Washington, PA. Um, Wetzel's Cave is there, and there was an overhang down from Wetzel's Cave, and long story short, Wetzel went out in the vicinity of where the turkey was, heard the turkey gobble, you know, looped around, came in behind it. The turkey was an Indian. Mm. And what the Indian was doing was he was making the turkey call. And then, of course, when somebody came out to um, hunt the turkey, the Indian shot him. Hmm. And that was pretty much the end of him hunting settlers. Right. Because Wetzel got him. Well, so I think <laughs> the thing we need to look at is, you know, when we look at these guys, uh, you know, mainly, you know, Brady and, and Wetzel is that they are products of their time. Yes. I mean, yeah, we look at them now and we say, oh, my God, those are atrocities. But would we have done something different if we were on the frontier protecting our family, protecting our loved ones? You know, would we have supported them, too? Because yeah. we would have felt, you know, they were doing what was right. Exactly. And there were atrocities on both sides. Right. Um, you know, the the I don't the natives were doing the exact same thing that the white settlers were doing, just like you said. Mm -hmm. Both sides thought they were in the right. Mm hmm. And back then, there wasn't really any rules to warfare. It was, right. you know, whatever it took. So it, it wasn't pretty. History is not pretty. Right. So I think that's the big thing is they're products of their time, and we can't judge them by our... Modern standards. By our modern standards. We have to look at what they did at, the, at their time. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we are here, so... Wait, wait. What what's what what happens to Lou Wetzel? Oh, oh yeah, I guess we should. Have, I guess we should. Have, uh, yeah, I mean we know what happens to him. He's right, well, he's right over here. here. Yeah. Okay. So okay, so after the incident with George Washington, the the native emissary or whatever you want to call him, um, again the 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 raids on the settlements were kind of at the final years. It was the late 1700s now, and basically he wasn't needed anymore. Mm. So he actually. I don't want to say migrated, but navigated. He went south. And he ended up down in Natchez, Mississippi. He relocated. He relocated. That's a good way of putting it. Relocated. Um, he was down around Natchez, Mississippi. He lived down there for a couple of years. Last few years of his life were quiet. Um, 1817? 16? I have to look at that headstone. I honestly don't remember. Um, he got sick. Hmm. They assume it was probably from yellow fever. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And he died. He was living with his um, cousin and his cousin's wife because, again, he never really settled down. <clears throat> and they buried him, and his cousin's wife specifically said, bury his rifle with him. A rifle that has killed that many men mm -hmm. will haunt whatever house it stays in. Oh, wow. So... In the 1940s, when, you know, history was becoming a little bit more in vogue, um, I forget, the, I, God, I'm so lousy with names on some of these people, but long story short, a guy went down to Natchez, Mississippi, and like our map boy over here, um, looked at all the old maps, determined where the cabin that his cousin had owned lived, and he talked to a bunch of people down there, and they pointed him to a field that had been plowed over. Long story short, they found a grave there. Hmm. And where Brady was about five foot eleven, six foot, Wetzel was five foot nine. Hmm. 
they found a skeleton in the grave of a man in his early 40s, about or about 40, um, that was about five foot nine. And a musket. And there was the remains of a rusted rifle in there. Nobody, and it irritates me, nobody knows where the pieces to that gun went. Because from what I understand, they didn't get reburied with him. Somebody kept them. Somebody kept them. Um, But they also found remnants or imprints, Brian, would you say? Very long hair in the grave. Hmm. Wetzel had hair down below his bottom. Oh, okay. And... Like Brian was saying about the top notch with the Indians with scalping, Wetzel wore his hair very long with the idea that if any man is ever good enough to get me, he'll have earned this top knot. Hmm. So um, in the 40s, they exhumed him, brought him back up here in a casket with silver lettering on it that says Lewis Wetzel, and they reinterred him here by his brother Martin in the McCreary Cemetery. So that's... Thankfully, the last few years of Wetzel's life were nice and quiet. Okay. Okay, so here we are at the uh, gravesite of Lewis Wetzel. Uh, as you can see, it's a modern stone. And I apologize earlier, I said the date was like 1816, 1870. He died in 1808. And it gives his birth year as 1763, which puts him at 44 years old when he passed away. Um, again, they found him down near Natchez, Mississippi. The grave actually says Rosetta, Mississippi. And he was brought back up here in the early 40s and reinterred here. Um, to my left are buried his uh, brother Martin, his wife Mary Ann, his mother Mary Bonnet or Bonnet Wetzel. And then, um, let me see, John, that is Captain John Wetzel. That would have been his father, um, although there is some debate as to whether he's actually buried there. Yeah, it says something about, I mean, there is a marker behind it, but yeah. that one there says buried at Graveyard Run. So. Yeah, so we're kind of confused as if to that marker, if he's actually buried there, or if that's just a marker to commemorate him and he's buried elsewhere. But, you know, regardless, uh, one thing I did forget to say about Wetzel earlier was uh, Wetzel did have a nickname. He was known as Death Wind. Um, and the reason he got that is, uh, for those who are familiar with the, uh, what was the Confederate battle cry um, when the, during the Civil War, the Confederates, the, the, the rebel yell. Oh, the yeah. The rebel oh, yeah. yell. Uh, Wetzel had his own earlier version of the rebel yell when he would attack. Um, he let out this a war whoop. absolutely frightening <laughs> war whoop, and he became to be known as Death Wind. Wow. So, but... Uh, Definitely an interesting figure in the history of the United States. Um, And uh, he was considered to be a Virginia Ranger during the Revolutionary War. So for that, we do uh, thank Lewis Wetzel for his service for our country. It really is just an incredible story uh, of of Lewis Wetzel. Um, You know, I I think, you know, as Rich said, and and as, as we said in the video, it's tough for us today to judge him and and you know look through our moral standards at some of the things that he did. Uh, he was considered a hero at the time. Today, you know, maybe not so much. You know, we look at him and, and he killed a lot of Native Americans. Uh, but you know, you have to look at him through the eyes of, of what was going on and, and the the view of what was going on back then, I think, is the way you have to look at things uh, sometimes. So, but amazing story, uh, you know, truly somebody that at the time was considered a hero uh, and, and and a defender of, of the frontier. So, uh, but next week we have our, our final uh, uh, part of this three-part series where we're going to visit the... Uh, the burial site of uh, Captain Samuel Brady. And he is another fascinating figure uh, with an incredible story and an incredible life. Uh, It was a short one, but man, did he do some incredible things in that short time. So uh, I wanna thank you again for joining us and I will see you next week for another episode of Laidback History.